we are available on Spotify and YouTube, so don't forget to subscribe for our latest episode. This podcast is lit. If you have low test scores, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but my class ain't one. Hit me! 99 problems, but my class ain't one. If your test scores are low, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems, but my class ain't one. Hello and welcome to the This Podcast is Lit podcast. Prospect School's English Department Poetry at the moment podcast. We are thinking about doing some podcasts in future on some of the other literature titles. Today it is the hottest day of the year so far, but we're not out on the golf course. We are <laughs> here recording our <laughs> podcast for all year 10 yeah. students. And we we're s- we're safe enjoy. in the clubhouse. We are safe we in the are. clubhouse. It's a bit too hot to be fair, isn't it, to be yeah. outside? So no, I love it. I would much way. rather be outside. I wanted to record this in the garden. Fair enough. Okay, well, uh, normally I go through and say hi to everybody and introduce them, but they've already introduced themselves. So, <laughs> the usual suspect, Mr. Ackroyd, this hi. way. And Hello. DJ Zoom. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's tee things off, shall we? Um, we're doing the podcast on um, a very good poem. One of, one of the better ones in the cluster, done by Alfred Lord Tennyson. And it's called Charge the Light Brigade. Um, sir, Mr. Ackroyd, how did you find your live lesson earlier? People seem to do well and understood the poem well. Yeah, I think it's difficult to do in an hour, really, because normally I'd have a couple yeah. of lessons for this and I'd set it up, spend quite a long time setting it up. So I did spend probably longer than you could argue in a live lesson on context, but I think it paid off in the end. I think it, I think it's it did what it said on the tin, in the tin. Yeah, I think they understood yeah. it and they engaged quite well with it, yeah. It's a bit weird doing it online, isn't it? You were telling me yeah. that you normally have people with chairs attacking yes. people with highlighters in the classroom. And <laughs> yeah, it's just a regular day, Mr. Halfway <laughs> classroom. <Clark's room. laughs> I normally get the, the, the light brigade at the back with some light artillery, some highlighters. I normally get the Russians in the corner of the classroom with chairs, heavy artillery. Um, and then I explain to them they, they should be going over there. They get the wrong message and then they end up going into the, into the heavy artillery of chairs and tables rather than. Yeah. The other way. Yeah. Yeah. But well, I can really do that in a live lesson, though, no. obviously. <laughs> no. it, it certainly wasn't a gimme, but I thought you did really well. I, I called it a hole in one. I thought you did very well. Okay, so um let's let's tee things off. Now, normally half of the course would be Miss Ray who would start, but on this occasion, poem in a headline is going to be by Mr. Ackroyd. Um, I, I struggled with this one this week. Actually, I normally have four or five and I, I enjoy doing them, uh, but wasn't up to par this week. Um, I only come up with one and I went for The Heroes Time Won't Forget. And really, it, it does speak for itself, but it's that idea that we're still looking at this poem 150 years on or whatever it is, and we are drawn to their heroism. And I took it from a, a 1974 sci-fi movie, The Land That Time Forgot, but obviously I twisted it around. I don't think we'll be forgetting this light brigade in a hurry. Good. Thanks very much, sir. Okay, well, Miss Ray, I'll let you play through. You can go next. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've gone for quite short and simple, like myself, as usual. I've gone for duty versus survival because I think it really exemplifies what actually happens in the poem. It is about a bunch of men who are having to choose between their... The, the biggest innate feature of a human being that's to survive versus their their feelings about duty and it forces them to choose between the two and actually the fact that they choose duty just shows us the power of things like nationalism and about order and pride okay and good i'll go next with i'm gonna i'm gonna quote somebody else i'm gonna go for some intertextuality again it got me five out of five a few weeks ago yeah. so i'll go for it again um my headline is dolce et decorum est pro patria mori which um, for the uninitiated is a Latin phrase, which means it's sweet and fitting to die for one's country. It was used by Wilfred Owen, uh, another poet in this cluster, um, in, a, in a poem of that title, Dolce Decorum Est Pro Patria Mori. But he refers to that as the old lie. He says it's an old lie. He's a soldier writing, you know, a good time after Tennyson was. He calls it an old lie. He suggests that it's not sweet and fitting to die for your own country, but I'm suggesting that Alfred Lord Tennyson is one of the pushers 
of this life, one of the people that were one of the people that are peddling it most. According to this poem, almost eternal glory awaits the man who dies for his country. He glorifies war in such a way. And therefore, I'm omitting the bit that it's an old line. I'm just saying, according to him, it's sweet and fitting to die for one's country. DJ Zoom with the Scots. Running a tight chip this morning, Mr. Mr. Zoom. Um, um, I'm going to have to find a fair way to, uh, to score this this week. Uh, I think Mr. Ackroyd uh, was uh, maybe... A little bit unlucky last week. Maybe I wasn't being too fair, but um, correct for this week. Um, I, I say that. I kind of say that every week, but anyway, <laughs> well, just my romantic. perception of it. Okay, so um, both with four points, Miss Ray and Mr. Ferkins. I do very much like your headlines this week, and uh, again, they very much tell the full story of it and kind of the, some of the key ideas. But I think uh, Mr. Ackroyd's idea, Heroes Time Won't Forget, and linking to that, um, the sci fi element of it, I quite like. Uh, yeah, definitely something that says a lot about the poem that is something that we shouldn't forget about these soldiers and the bra- brave charge they made. So, for you, five points. Brilliant. Okay, then. Well, we're going to move on to our second segment of the show, which is called What is the Most Important Quote and Why? And this is the bit where we talk about our favourite quote from the poem. It's a quote which we think you should take into your exams with you, have it at the front of your memories, ready to bring up, should you get a question which um, allows you to. Let's start off with Miss Ray. What is the most important quote and why? Well, for me, I've gone for Jaws of Death, because actually I think that probably exemplifies lots of the themes in the poem. It's probably quite a good all-rounder. Um, so the word jaws kind of makes you think of this ravenous, hungry creature, and it just really um, exaggerates how scary this must have been for the soldiers. And then with the capitalization of death combined with that word of jaws, you've got that that really quite terrifying hell imagery, which brings in the religious aspects. But I think more than that, I think by calling it jaws of death, it's personifying into one creature. So actually the enemy for these soldiers is not lots of other enemies, it's one big giant enemy. It's almost like the boss at the end of the video game, that really big boss battle you have right at the end of the video game that you know is going to be so difficult to beat. So it just exemplifies how difficult it is going to be for these men to actually survive. It's um, it's overwhelming and emphasises how brave those men are. But it does also have those connotations of almost like the fact these soldiers are kind of food for a war machine and it dehumanises these soldiers and it just, again, reinforces the idea that they were just, they weren't treated as humans, they were treated like cogs in the machine. Thank you very much, Miss Gray. Well, I'll go second since you've teed me up quite nicely with your ideas of dehumanisation. So my favourite quote is, there's not a reason why, there's but to do and die. Now, when I read this line with a 21st century lens on, it's not very democratic, is it? There's not a reason why. Now, that to me feels like they've got absolutely no voice whatsoever. And of course, this poem appears in a power and conflict cluster. And we're looking at people here, soldiers with no voice, no say whatsoever. Sounds rather powerless to me. We discussed during the poem Kamikaze, The kamikaze pilot was a man who was powerless because he had no voice. But here, Alfred Will Tennyson has completely spun this. He almost makes out as if it's brave or the right thing to not have a voice. You're not supposed to question authority. You're not supposed to question a queen or a captain, a sergeant, maybe even for the common man on the street, the person who might well hear this. Maybe you're not supposed to question your boss. If you're supposed to just do as you're supposed to do. Especially these soldiers have led by example. They've just done their job, theirs but to do and die. And it feels a little bit like we as readers are being told that maybe we should be doing the same thing. Mr. Ackroyd, you next. Yeah, um, I followed my theme of trying to pick a more unusual quote. So I've gone for all the world wondered and it is repeated as well. <clears throat> and again, I tried to unpick it for a few reasons. Well, I think first of all, this almost stops the action. We're in the, the middle of it, this breathless action, and it just gives the, the reader a, a, a pause just to take stock. And then 
obviously take stock of what and what does um, Tennyson want us to take stock of? Well, mm. all the world wondered is this is reaching newfound people. This was the first piece of war journalism. This wouldn't have been commented on before. And Tennyson's almost referencing himself here. He found out about this in a Times newspaper, which was the first, as I've said, the first kind of war report that we got in newspapers. Um, again, as well, that wonder and it adds an epic tone to the poem. Um, these are our brave heroes, and we are filled as a reader with awe and wonder at how brave they are. Another reason as well, the reader might actually be amazed by why they're not questioning it, what's mm -hmm. happened, or, or actually wondering what led this blunder to happen. Going further into it, there's another one in there, which if we just isolate it, and the one in wondered. And one thing's for certain, all the world did wonder, but the Light Brigade won immortal glory, as they certainly are heroes time won't forget. Fantastic. Okay, DJ Zoom with the scores. Okay, uh, so uh, where four points is uh, Mr. Firkins there. Uh, very well explained. Uh, definitely a nice idea of linking it to Kamikaze as well, the powerlessness of it and taking that different spin on the poem. Uh, so very well done, four points. Next is Mr. Ackwood, also with four points, all the world wondered, and like the idea that it stops and takes stock, and there's a little bit of history you brought in there as well, a bit of context, which is quite nice, so that is the kind of first kind of mass media reporting of uh, war or conflicts around the world, uh, so very nice idea there. Uh, but in first place there, with five points, is Miss Ray, very well analysed, and focusing on the little details like the capital letter and you linked it to the video games one of my favorite things so <laughs> that i just need to give you five points anyway so yeah mm. five points. not as i look at my mr g yeah i did like the i did like the linking um of it to the capital letter i thought that was good yeah thank you i also like the way mr perkins linked it to the power and conflict cluster too what is what has happened to, have you been out in the sun, Mr. Ackroyd? Are you feeling a Yeah, too much sun. <laughs> I, I think I'll just try being nice for a change. I've I don't had, like ten, it. I've had my 10 seconds of that. I'll go back to normality now. Please do. I don't like it. I don't like yeah. changes. You won't it's all right. so, I wouldn't worry. You're not out of woods yet. <laughs> oh. No, that's it. Well, with the front line completed, maybe you're getting a little bit tired, a little bit wearisome, but back mine's coming up and the clubhouse is in sight. And I think you're starting to feel a bit happier of himself, maybe. Okay, and let's. Structure. This part of the segment is unscored. Still don't know why not, but it's not. Um, it's an unscored element where we talk about structure. Uh, Miss Ray, what do you think about the structure of this poem? So the thing that I wanted to talk about, because there's actually a structure thing that I'm saving for my two faults, so I'm going to speak very briefly. Ooh, yeah. Be careful. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm weary. Um, so actually, it's all about the end stop lines, and there's an awful lot of end stop lines in this poem, and it just reinforces how determined those soldiers were on that on that afternoon to, to do their duty. There's no argument, there's no questioning, and that is reinforced by those end stop lines. Mr. Trackwood, what do you think? Yeah, and again, I'm going to mention some kind of structural element in my What Fools Don't Know, Ooh. so I'll try and move away from that for now. But I like the ballad element. This, this is a ballad, mm. and the idea of the refrain, the repeated into the valley of death road the 600, and this is like a hook that we hang on to as a song. And it does back up that Tennyson wanted this to be sung from the rooftops, their heroism, not necessarily the, the political aspects, but their heroism. And it has a real musicality to it, this poem, the, the, the driving rhythm, the propulsive beat that kind of mirrors the marching of the, the drums, the, the, the horse hoofs flying over that kind of wide expanse. And it just adds a real epic element to the poem that I love. It does. You found an amazing video on YouTube earlier. I've not seen that one before, but that lady who was almost rapping. Yeah. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. You have to oh, Holly, drop yeah, the link I, somewhere. Yeah, Holly McNeese. Yeah, she's actually a poet, um, quite, yeah. quite a famous poet, like a spoken word poet um, in our time. But I just thought that was a good one, a good one to, to show as well. And, you know, I, I, I just think also, I, I'm trying to be inclusive, but I think that, it's not just for, for blokes, this poem, uh, you know, just finding a, a woman saying it as well, um, mm. I think makes it a little bit more reclusive as well. I think we can all kind of imagine ourselves in the, on that horseback kind of riding in if it's spoken in the right way. Absolutely. Well, as I said, Clubhouse is in sight, back nine time. 
What you fools don't know. Okay, last segment of the show. What you two fools don't know. I'll kick us off this week. And uh, I'll kick off with what you two Merry Andrews don't know. <laughs> is that this is a poem, as Mr. Rackwood just said, quite anthemic. It's supposed to be paying tribute to courage and heroism in the face of a devastating defeat. But is it really? Who exactly were these soldiers fighting for? Were they fighting for queen and country as it's been suggested by this poem? I mean, this poem really, let's be honest, it does join the national anthem in the sentiment and it's quite anthemic as we've already mentioned. Those lyrics of God save the Queen, send her victorious, happy and glorious. It, this is straight off the bat, straight off the club face. This is exactly the same kind of a poem. It's patriotic, it's nationalistic, and let's be honest, it's propaganda. Alfred Lord Tennyson, poet laureate, had an extremely close relationship with Queen Victoria. In fact, out of all the poet laureates from what I've been reading, he had one of the closest relationships on record. He's an intensely patriotic person for this reason, I would suspect. At the time, he was writing a fair amount of pro-military uh, poetry. And in 1855, this poem was actually censored. In 1855, Tennyson removed the line, somebody had blundered. So even though the poem was already extremely biased, pretty much was lying by omission the whole way through because there was only one small little line about anybody actually making a mistake. Even though it was already like that, it got censored even further stripping away the only nod to a mistake being made. Now, I just find this quite interesting. I think that Tennyson, through this poem, was building and contributing towards that idea, as I said in my headline, of it being brilliant to die for your country, put your life on the line for your country. But I suppose, like I'm saying, this really is him feeding into this nationalistic propaganda machine which ultimately was responsible for future wars. I look ahead to World War I, six million Englishmen mobilised in World War I with this idea that it's amazing to die for your country, the glorification of war. But it took actual soldiers, such as the likes of Wilfred Owen, the poet in this cluster, to strip away these lies, the, the idea that people like Tennyson and Queen Victoria herself were spreading, because they are lies. And it took soldiers to tell us the truth. It was certainly never going to be the Queen, or her mm -hmm. poet laureate. Okay, let's go to Mr. Rackwood next, please. What you two fools don't know. Yeah, quite interesting counterpoint to Mr. Firkins. I agree with everything Mr. Firkins said. I thought he said it very eloquently. And I think it is a propaganda poem. I don't think there's any doubt about that. However, what's brilliant about this poem is I think it acts as both a propaganda poem and the criticism of those that are in charge. He was a poet laureate. He did have a good relationship with the Queen. And he was trying to glorify um, the, the soldiers that ended up in this military's disaster. However, let's make no mistakes, this was a major military blunder. It was a giant albatross around the empire's neck. And the fact that he put the line back in, I think adds weight to the fact there's criticisms in here. We need to be oh, look at it like as a secret code. I think Tennyson's being subversive in places here. Let's just have a look at his, his code a little bit. I'm going to start off with that word, that word blundered. The rhythm of this poem is um, dactylic diameter, which is one stress followed by two unstressed. That is the only word in the poem that does not have this mm. rhythm to it. So for word, the light brigade, charge for the guns, he said. It's all got six syllables, but that one doesn't. Someone had blundered, has five syllables. The focus is on the blunder. That's for a reason. Also, he rhymed blundered with hundred. And they don't rhyme properly as well. It sits uneasy. Just maybe that under the surface, this sat uneasy with Tennyson, the way that these had been almost, the, the soldiers had been sacrificed to their death. Um, there's another thing I found as well, that this isn't a one-off. If you look closer and look at some of the, the words, the vocabulary is chosen to mirror sound. Blundered, thundered, shattered, sundered, wondered. Very strong sounding to mimic the horses. We've talked about this, but if you look closer, they all contain the word erd at the end, E-R-E-D, which is to error. Therefore, subtly and subversively drawing attention to an error made. That's the focus. 
Very good. Final point. Final point. Sorry, does no. not make final point. <laughs> last point <laughs> is that term league, half a league, half a league. Strange term. It's a nautical term. Mm. Tennyson actually lost a lot of money to the to, to the aristocracy. He was conned. And there's a bit of him that is anti-wealth. And the light brigade, actually don't know if a lot of people know this, but you had to buy your way into the light brigade. It contained the wealthiest individuals. They didn't have military experience. And is he by saying half a league, half a league, right at the beginning, hiding in plain sight, suggesting that these military generals that buy their way in are actually out of their league? Either way, what a poem that we can look at it both as a propaganda poem and a critique of those in power both at the same time. Nice. Wow, well, follow follow that, Miss Ray, because I feel like uh, we've, done, <laughs> we've covered pretty much a lot of the poem there. We have, and um, I think it says a lot about Mr. Ackroyd and I that he's gone for some really in-depth um, knowledge there and some really in-depth looking at the language. I'm going to talk about how the poem looks on the page. Um, <laughs> and actually, <laughs> if you... Yeah, I, you know me, I love an aesthetic. I'm a sucker for a pretty thing. Um, so you can see the first four stanzas, first four stanzas, or well, the first three stanzas, sorry, the fourth line of each of those stanzas is indented. Um, and actually, I started looking at that and I wanted to think about why that is and whether there was a bit of a pattern there. So it's almost like it's a little bit ordered. It's almost like it's a little bit kind of regular, which is exactly what you'd expect from some sort of cavalry. But then when it gets onto the fourth stanza and later on, it changes. It no longer is that fourth line that's being indented. So it starts to become a little bit chaotic. It starts to become like, like an actual battle in the middle of the battle. So is it chaotic because it's like the orders that are being given and how chaotic they are? Is it random signifying the soldiers being lost? Literally, there are chunks being taken out because that's where you can see the soldiers falling. Or is it the indents on the lives that this battle would have had and actually not just the soldiers that were there but their families and things like that um but the fact that it's not regular the fact that it is disrupted halfway through the poem is that Tennyson saying that actually he wants to disrupt things does he want change is it him kind of again to reinforce everything Mr Ackroyd said is it him a way of him indicating that he doesn't want the status quo to carry on that actually he does want something to change I think it was quite fascinating actually if we um yeah. Not to pat ourselves on the back too greatly, but <laughs> if we uh, tee it, you know, add our three comments together, I suppose we're, we're looking at a poet in conflict in quite a lot of this. On the one hand, Absolutely. he's got his own opinions, but he's in conflict with this idea that he has to write something pro-country, pro-queen, mm. pro-military. And he, he, you can almost see that, can't you? That, that a line being in one edit, a line being taken out of another edit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's... Uh, it's actually quite fascinating to look at the history of the actual writing of this poem in itself. Great. But he's succeeded, hasn't he? That's the key. I yeah. think he's succeeded in writing a propaganda poem, as you've said, one that glorifies mm -hmm. the, the duty of the, the Light Brigade. You could argue yeah. it's a bit of after rationalisation as well, I guess, that it was a massive embarrassment, this, and he's trying to kind of grasp a little bit of victory from the jaws of defeat. However, the fact that he also pulls it off by subversing mm. certain elements that if you cared to look is there is, is just a mastercraft really and yeah. it's true to life isn't it that nothing is black and white like you can no. you can be very proud of your country and proud of yeah. the things that soldiers do for your country but not agree with war i don't think the two things are mutually exclusive they Agreed. exist together the fact that Absolutely. it's a propaganda poem and a piece of subversion yeah i agree nice okay well i have to admit on this occasion i think it's gonna be pretty tough for mr zoom mm -hmm. let's see let's see what he's got for us I think he's up to the task, Mr. Zoom. Yeah, looks like uh, yeah. we might have some internet problems on Mr. Zoom's end. Yeah. I think he said that Katie got 100 marks because she's nice. <laughs> yeah, we'll just fill in for him, so. shall we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mr. Ackroyd, no points. <laughs> Mr. Ackroyd, two points because you're my boss. <laughs> Mr. Ackroyd, 100 points. Okay, so... Uh, he's back. With... Yes, hello, Mr. <laughs> Zoom. I did, I did your points for you, DJ. Don't worry, I've done oh, it for you. you. I'm going to have to... Um, Go back over them, I think. Uh, <laughs> oh, seems so hard, but okay. In, with eight points, uh, Miss Ray, very nice no, idea. You said 100 wrong, my love. You said 100 <laughs> wrong. <laughs> uh, very nice idea of the indentation, that little minute detail again. I, I love how you spot these little things and how it could be interpreted in such a different way, like he's trying to disrupt the order and all those things. Um, so, yeah, great point for you, eight points. Next 100, point. thank you. 
<laughs> Next uh -huh. is Mr. Ferkins. Uh, I love it how you always bring in a bit of history as well, stuff that uh, we don't really know about, stuff that we fools don't know, and how he was quite um, close to the Queen at the time. And that definitely helps feed into the narrative of, uh, you know, this um, this patriotism of, in the story of the Charter Light Brigade and how he's kind of kind of driving it, isn't he? And how actually he's actually quite a damaging thing and it took until World War One for someone to step up and fight against it. So for you, nine points. But I'm just putting it, I'm just uh, putting it out there. Mr. Ackroyd's idea, amazing. Uh, it literally was uh, a revelation of the ad and the kind of how he's rhymed. Mm. It's just so subtle, Mr. Ackroyd, that uh, something that, again, I'm going to have to steal and uh, put into my own lessons for you. That, that was definitely my ace, my ace in the hole. <laughs> it was. There was no, no, no tripping up and falling in a bunker, with Mr. Ackroyd. Yeah. This week. No. Yeah, it was a good putt for victory. Well done. Yeah. You did very well. Are we, so the high school still wins, yeah? Well, let's talk about the leaderboard. I mean, we're, we're basically in the clubhouse <laughs> now, but let's have a quick chat about this final <laughs> leaderboard. Let's have it, Mr. Right. Zoom. A nice cup of tea. We want we we the scorecards. The scorecards. Yeah. Okay, so with 17 points is Miss Ray. Next with 18 points is Mr. Perkins. And our winner today is Miss Agro with 19 points. Well, Mr. Ackroyd, never very good effort for you today. He's becoming increasingly nuanced, isn't he, this guy from Yorkshire, you know? Yeah. The straight-talking guy. He's, he's, each week he gets more and more nuanced. Good effort. I thought I'm trying to figure out if that's a, an insult or a compliment. It's I'm both. Thinking, Take it however well, I've never, you I've never, want. I've never, I've never noticed you've been nuanced before. <laughs> the two are not mutually exclusive, Mr. Ackroyd. <laughs> I can't, I'm trying to figure out if it's patronising, um, a compliment, or anything, I don't know. It might maybe, like you say, voice. maybe they're all three are existing it. at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Don't, I was just doing a Tennyson. Yeah, I was doing a Tennyson. I was doing <laughs> Fair it, enough, deliberately yeah. vain. <laughs> okay, then. Well, then, guys, thank you very much for your efforts this week. We can all relax, uh, get ourselves a nice pop or whatever it is we're going to be doing now. Um, thanks very much for discussing the poem. What we what have we got next week, Mr. Ackroyd? We're going to do poppies next week, which again is is a, a unique poem within that cluster. And I think one, well, I know I like it. Um, I'm yeah, assuming absolutely. both of you like it as well. Absolutely, yeah. always. Oh, it's got to be right up there as one of the favourite ones, I think. No, um, definitely. And again, looking at soldiers and how they've been represented. Um, so it's quite interesting to have them back to back, actually. I think that'll work nicely. Okay, then. Well, on that bombshell mm -hmm. from the winner, the Maverick. From the brains, from the DJ, from Mr. Perkins. Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.